Jumping in on Manx Radio with Howard and Chris Kane. Hello, good evening, and welcome. Here we are once again, Saturday night on Mike's Radio, 9 o'clock. It's jumping in the best in modern and contemporary jazz around from the cats in the hats. That's myself, H. And from me, Chris. Yes, welcome along to this week's Jumping In. Have we got a bit of a treat in store for you? Well, I don't just mean because the kids go back to school next week, but an interview with a man who knows rather a lot about the jazz world's second most recorded composer. First was Ellington, by the way. This composer had a daughter known as Boo Boo, who was born on September the 5th, coincidentally, if that helps. So what have been your specialities this week, H? Well, I'm thinking some purple violets with the great Sam Rivers. And I am thinking two tracks, back to back, all being well, to celebrate a hundred years of bird. And from me, well, we have an uncommon happening, a quiet choir, a saucy scooter, and to kick us off, here we have a tribute to two great jazz names who recently left us with Dizzy Heights, here's Pendulum. Thank you. 
Thank you.
pendulum there, formerly known as the Berkshire Jazz Youth Orchestra, bringing back very happy memories of sitting, watching the band in the waterboard car park stage at Brecon Jazz Festival for the Sunday brunch spot with the Sunday papers, a uh, Welsh dragon sausage bap and a pint of spa. Although they also played at uh, Montreux Jazz Festival, which unfortunately we never got to as of yet. The band was founded back in 1974 by the charismatic Patrick Kelly, who also inspired many young musicians, not only with the love of jazz, but fostered them onto great solo careers, including Steve Steve Waterman, Simon Allen and Jamie Cullum, who we saw with the band the last time we saw them. Patrick died peacefully aged 88 in June and more recently, saxophonist Pete King also left us. King, who aged 19, was booked uh, to open the new London Jazz Club, Ronnie Scott's in 1959, played with Johnny Dankworth's orchestra, the Maynard Ferguson Big Band, Tubby Hayes and uh, most recently and most familiarly, Stan Tracy's band. And Pete once described Pendulum as one of the best young bands the country's ever heard. And he wrote that piece for them, featured on the alto solo with additional solos from Gerard Presencer on trumpet, Pip Billington on the piano and Adam Goldsmith on the guitar. Mm, very fine, and yes, I do miss being at a jazz festival. Hopefully, we'll get back to Fingers one. Fingers crossed, everything crossed. Sometime. Listening to jumping in, of course, with uh, Chris and myself, H, a uh, bit of a special. We've got an interview coming up uh, for you shortly, uh, more than that in a few minutes. Also, 100 years, of course, since Charlie Parker was born. Uh, get a couple of tracks in there as well. Here's one I was just digging through, looking at something, uh, just rummaging, really, for a few bits and pieces, and thought, gosh, I haven't had this man for a while. One of my favourites, not that many albums kicking around, some of them not that easy to get sometimes. Sam Rivers left us a few years ago, wonderful player in the sort of the modern uh, spectrum and was often playing with younger cats as they say, as he was here, Ben Street on bass Kristen Osgood on drums and Brian Carrot Vibes, a track called In Search of Black Benny Yeah, I like-
like that one. Didn't get very good reviews, it must be uh, said. And uh, Kristen Osgood on Drummonds was uh, hammered by some. I, sounds fine to me, I must admit. Uh, good lineup, really. Ben Street, as I say, bass and Brian Carrot on the vibes there and uh, on tenor sax and also on flute and some numbers, the great Sam Rivers. Uh, Fuchsia Sing Song, you ever see that? Well worth checking out on Blue Note. And uh, next from me, a young pianist who I've enjoyed in a number of bands uh, with the saxophonist Duncan Eagles with his uh, recent release we played last year, I think, and uh, the Ollie Howell Quartet. But it's London-based Tom Miller, whose 2017 debut album, Unnatural Events, is also well worth a listen. Here's Azura Days. Good indeed. Yes, Azura Days, taken from Tom Miller's debut album, Unnatural Events. After studying music at King's College, Cambridge, Tom went on to do the jazz course at the Royal Academy and then put together a cracking band of uh, fellow graduates, many of whom are band leaders in their own right, Alex Monk on guitar, bassist uh, Musha Milov Abado, whose uh, band we have featured, very good artist too, uh, Mike Clues on the drums, and Alice Zawadzki on vocals. 
Very nice indeed. It is, of course, jumping in and big birthday this week as well. Uh, sadly, not someone who's around with us, but it's 100 years since Charlie Yard Bird Parker was born, of course. Possibly one of the most, outside of maybe Miles Davis, one of the most famous jazzers ever. So influential even now on so many young jazzers coming up, leading the bebop revolution. Uh, that incredible plastic saxophone he played uh, quite often in the early days. He did at least sort of the white one, inspiring the likes of uh, sort of Ornette Coleman with the same sort of thing there. The whole bebop sound was very much geared around him, brilliant technically, plagued with the demons of drugs and drink, and sadly uh, died at a very young age, in, uh, I think in his 30s or thereabouts, but left such a great recorded legacy, which has been enjoyed by generations ever since, and no doubt will be for generations to come as well. Uh, we're going to celebrate 100 years of Charlie Bird Parker with a bit of Charlie himself from the Cole Porter songbook, and then we're also going to have a take by a man that used to play with them as well in the older days and still going. Roy Haynes, one of the last from the generation in his 90s, and as far as I know, still beating the skins. Happy birthday, Charlie. Hi, this is Clark Tracy. You're listening to Jumping In on Manx Radio.
Lovely stuff. Uh, April in Paris, of course. Roy Haynes, who played often enough in the day with the man himself, Charlie Parker. In this case, a tribute to Charlie Parker, recorded many, many years after Charlie Parker had died. Dave Holland, Roy Hargrove, Dave Kukowski and Kenny Garrett joining him on that. And before that, of course, my heart belongs to Daddy from the Cole Porter songbook, recorded many, many years earlier with Charlie Parker himself, of course, taking the duties on alto sax as well. And uh, yes, a hundred years, would you believe it, since Charlie Parker was uh, born. 35 he was when he passed away. 30, I knew it was 35, 36, 37. Yeah. I thought yeah. you were optimistic to expect him to still be playing at 100, particularly with his lifestyle. No. That would be uh, well, pushing it a little amazing. bit. But, yeah, he, Roy Haynes is still playing. I say 90 something, yeah. <laughs> yes, he's well into his 90s. I think he's still going. Marvellous stuff. And yes, what, what would he be doing if he's playing now? That's the question, isn't it? Jumping in, H and Chris with you today, of course, and we have something a bit of a special coming up for you. We've been lining up one or two interviews, and uh, hopefully we're going to do another one this afternoon with a bit of luck. But here's a man we spoke to, what, a week or two back, was it? Yeah, a couple of weeks ago. Something like that, and this is the wonderful John Beasley with his Munkestra, and what a sound. <laughs>
Ugly Beauty and Panonica, John Beasley presents the Munkestra Volume 2. His latest album is actually Munkestra presents John Beasley. I have three records to do with this deal, so-called record deal. And, um, you know, I just, it just got to the point where I, feel, I felt like to do a whole nother record of Thelonious Monk was a stretch. And maybe, uh, I don't know, it just felt like, like I should probably mix in some other music. Um, you know, on this record, we have Char- a Charlie Parker tune, we have Donna Lee, we have a Duke Ellington tune. Um, and then and then I thought, well, you know, I, I should probably write a little bit too. And um, the title of the record, you know, it has a bit of a throwback feel to it, which I like, you know. Sure. Uh, you know, uh, Ella Fitzgerald sings the Cole Porter song book or something like that, you know. Yeah, or so, Oscar um, Peterson plays those series of great albums. Exactly, you know. So, so uh, not to put myself on that level, but, you know, kind of a take a cue from that era. And the record company liked the idea, and... Um, here we are. Our father was a great fan of Peterson, who we got to interview on, on the forerunner to this show some years ago. And I think the first time I heard Round About Midnight, it was Oscar Peterson playing it. And when subsequently, probably around about the age of 10 or so, I heard Monk playing it, I said, I don't know who this guy is, but he's absolutely murdering what's a fantastic tune. Um, now, I know that you're actually <laughs> <laughs> the uh, director for the uh, Monk Institute. What what brought uh, Thelonious Monk into your life? Well, like you said, um you know, you have a, a musical family. I, I did too. My dad, you know, uh, was a professional musician and, a, and an educator, and he was always had bringing records around the house and stuff. And particularly on, I remember, I think Saturday morning, you know, would be the big cleanup day, right, in the house, uh, and he'd just be blasting records all the time. And uh, you know, I, I remember hearing Bobby Timmons this way. I remember hearing Bird this way. Uh, and then one day he put on uh, uh, Work by Sonny. It's, uh, it's a Monk tune. Well, it's a Monk record called Work. Yes. With Sonny Rollins and a French horn player, Jimmy Buffington. And I think Art Blakey and Sam Jones, I want to say. Um, and so all of a sudden, you know, we're little kids just running around and, and help trying to help clean and probably not helping at all. And uh, all of a sudden the energy in the house just changed immediately you know so um you know i was like well what is that because it just sounded well it sounded grooving which is awesome right but so astoundingly different and sort of childlike in a way you know yes and um um so that was my first experience hearing monk do you think he was really ahead of his time? Because he wasn't that much appreciated in his time afterwards. Now, here we are, 30, 40, whatever years on, and his music probably more popular than ever, still being discovered by new generations, and still sounds incredibly fresh and modern. I think we're just now catching up to Monk. Although, what I, as well as Coltrane and Ornette, to, to be quite honest, I sure. think, and Eric Dolphy, if you listen to uh, younger artists now, they're really starting out like now where we're sort of Monk and, and, uh, and, and Eric Dolphy and harmonically and, and uh, Coltrane left in a way, you know, Shabaka, uh, you know, Rudrish, Melissa Aldana, uh, you know, it's advanced, you know, but I, I also would like to say that Polonius Monk, it's almost like his left hand, was in the 30s and his right hand was in the <laughs> yeah, next good way of putting it. in the future indeed <laughs> um yeah, now you've suffered you know, a, a lot of uh, obviously through lockdown and the covid situation i know you've had a great many years working in the film composing uh, industry as well is that something that you've been able to keep up with that work whilst you've been locked down no unfortunately uh we were um, supposed to work on a film but the director you know they're in post so they couldn't get together and get into a uh uh, an edit bay. Oh dear. You know, with yeah. four or five other people in a small edit bay. So there's one in the books, but uh, we haven't started yet. I will have to say in January, Monkestra recorded a film score for a Steven Soderbergh film um, with Meryl Streep, uh, Candace Bergen, and uh, Diane Weiss. Yeah, good lineup. And uh, yeah, it's a really good film. But it, take, it took place on the Queen Mary on a cruise ship, oh. and I think I think they're sitting on it until all this sort of blows over. 
Yes, it's not because a, of, you know all the the, yeah. the beginning you know the outbreaks uh, in the beginning were were on cruise ships yeah, yeah. and stuff. So, so unfortunately, we have one in the can that features actually features Mungastra, and the temp score they temp the John Barry Big Band. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I did yeah. notice, I was reading a little bit about uh, the career, and uh, I know that you had a garage band years ago called Audio Mind with Vinnie Caluta, John Patitucci, and Steve Tavaglioni. And I think the first album of yours that I bought myself was probably Silent Singing um, from Steve, which, oh. is, which is a, a great album, you know, really underrated album. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, there's rumor of some bootleg tapes that you might have around. Are they going to get released whilst you're still at home? You know, that's a good idea. Yeah, I should. You know, unfortunately, they don't cassette, but I could probably remaster that. Yeah, that's a good idea. What's, what's I'm going to let this one ride out. A, this new record, uh, Munkster plays Job Beasley, ride out a little bit first, though. It's yeah. a, I'll, I'll give you my number for the 10%. That's absolutely fine. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what is your take on the current jazz scene? Because you quite often hear numerous times oh, of the death of jazz and such like. Uh, from our perspective over here, listening to music through Europe, from America, from around the world, it's, it seems in a pretty... COVID notwithstanding, seems in a pretty healthy state with no end of uh, people with, with great ideas, whether it's on that side of the Atlantic, this side of the Atlantic, or somewhere else. Well, I mean, since, I guess, the 40s, since bebop, it's been sort of, you know, sort of put in the same category in a way, if you will, as classical music as far as popularity, you know, where I think classical and jazz are like something like 2% of the market or something like that, right? Record sales. Um, yeah, but so it's, it's it's always been niche, you know. It's an art form, so it's not it's not pop music. It's not uh, formulaic, you know. Um, so it's, it's you know people have been calling for the death of jazz since the beginning, you know, and it's not going anywhere. The young people more there's more young people probably playing jazz than ever now. Absolutely, you know. Uh, my daughter works for uh, for UMG Universal Music Group. Uh huh. She said she said during COVID. Classical and jazz have been soaring on on streaming services. Wow! Most and probably radio too, because people are at home working and they're listening to more stuff they want to listen to while they work, and maybe they're chilling out their kids like our parents did, you know, with with jazz uh, at home.
Taken from saxophonist Steve Tavaglioni's 1997 album Silent Singing, that was Eclipsis, written by and featuring our guest John Beasley on keyboards, along with Jeff Beale on trumpet. A great atmospheric album, that, and they were all pals back in the day and had a garage band. John said he might see if he could dig out some old tracks to play from uh, their recordings as youngsters. Well, that about wraps up this week's Jumping In. We've just got time to fit in a track from the retrospective release from guitarist Tim Motzer, who celebrates 22 years on the road and recording, and in this case with his laptop, a bunch of effects and his acoustic guitar. See you next week. Here's Chimoto. Look after yourselves. Bye for now. Thank you.